Hi, I'm Christy, and this is Today We Tried, a parenting podcast brought to you by Kaluga, where we talk about big moments in parenthood and break them down to make them feel less daunting and more doable. I'm a mom of three and chief parent officer and general counsel at Kaluga, and usually I'm here with my husband, Ted, but I am super excited to be here today with Molly, my sister. We are all now facing the daunting parenting challenge of parenting during COVID, and Molly is the perfect person to share some tips and tricks today about how to help your kids feel safe during this crisis. I'm really happy she's here to chat with everyone because she always gives me great advice. So welcome, Molly. You want to introduce yourself a little bit? Sure. Hi. I'm Molly. I'm a psychiatrist who works with children, teenagers, and adults, and I specialize in taking care of people who have serious medical illnesses, such as cancer. I'm also trained as a pediatrician, and I am the mom of two boys, a a two-and-a-half-year-old and a a newborn. And so in the middle of all of this, I am also on maternity leave. I mean, it's hard to imagine a more (laughs) different maternity leave than what we all expected. And Molly and I, we're both now in Philly, but we have to be recording separately because of social distancing. Mm -hmm. And I haven't gotten to see enough of my new nephew or my old nephew. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm excited for us all to be able to get back together. Okay. So I, again, really appreciate you being here and let's just jump right in to today's topic, which is helping our kids feel safe during COVID. So first, we just wanted to start by sharing some background about what's been happening in our own homes. I have four-year-olds. Their school actually just officially closed for the rest of the year. I just got that email. And I don't know if Ben, if Ben's school is like closed officially or is that? You know, it's it's closed right now. It's a daycare. So I don't know if there will at some point be a different exception. They didn't get an exception They tried to get an exception because they take care of a lot of kids of essential workers, but they are closed. And so I'm assuming they're going to stay closed as well. Yeah. And my kids have been doing a Zoom circle time with their teachers. And I actually just saw Lark's teacher was showing the class her homemade mask on their circle time, which I was really happy to have seen because Lark didn't raise any questions to me about it. So I wouldn't have even known it happened. So they're asking some questions definitely for the baby when he's about a year old. It's more that he's just clearly reacting to a big change in his routine. He used to have peaceful mornings with our nanny when the kids were in school, and now it's just all chaos all the time. <laughs> when now he, the big kids are sitting in my lap and reading them a book, he'll now just kind of like dive bomb us to try to get some attention. <laughs> and oh, man. Fighting is starting, which That's might sure. be teething. It might be him being like, what is <laughs> happening? Yeah, yeah need to fight something. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's, a, it's a big, I can tell even with the little guy, like it's a change mm-hmm. for him. Mm-hmm. And Ben is two and a half. Is he asking questions too? Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. He wants to know why he's not going to school, why we can't go to restaurants. The other day we were out for a social distancing walk and he asked, to go clothes shopping, which he's never <laughs> shown any interest in before. Um, but, you know, great. And I said, well, you know, the the stores are closed right now, but we could order some new clothes online. You know, I could have. Yeah. And he, yeah, yeah. But he was insistent that he wanted to go to a store, a store. I don't want to go to clothes. Any store. store. Just yeah. Store. And, you know, I think, I mean, I really think that was him sort of just asking the question, right? Of like, what's still happening? What can we still do? Um, is this closed? Is this closed? You know, we walk by church. Oh, can people go to church? No, people can go to church. You know, you know, so any anywhere we go, yeah. we're sort of asking about. And, you know, I, so we um, are trying to frame it. We have a new baby in the house anyway right and so yeah. we would be more attuned to germs than we usually would regardless but we've definitely been talking more about you know chicken wing coughing into his elbow that's impressive if he's doing that already yeah yeah he's, well his teachers were good at introducing that that's as good. but I would yeah. say it's definitely yeah, yeah. you know he's he's been more aware of that I saw the phrase germ busters somewhere. I don't even remember where. I'm talking to kid, your kids about being germ busters and Ben loves ghost busters. So we've adopted that language and he, <laughs> he that's really funny. Um, and so, But that's really helpful for him. He's like, you know, 
why can't we go to a restaurant? Well, we're being germ busters right now, remember? And so, you know, and then he'll say yes. And then when the germs go away, then we can go back. And so he's, he's starting to talk about a little bit of that too. That's awesome. And that's nicely more proactive. Like we're being like, not just staying home, but like, we're actually germ busters. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. 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 We're mm-hmm. taking, these are things um, that we can do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Like something we can do. Yeah. I've used the word germs. I haven't really used the words coronavirus or COVID with mm-hmm. them. Like specifically, they have started saying, talking about the virus. Mm. So they're, oh, wow. It. But yeah, they, the other day they were scooting around our little parking spot and they were like, the virus, the virus, wow. like a weird kind of accent. I don't know what they were doing exactly, but clearly the virus is like something they're hearing. Yeah. And, and that's what we would expect to see is to have kids, you know, process their world and the things that they're learning about through play. And we all see this in sort of regular life, you know, when they, when you see them come home and play things at school or when I was pregnant and Ben would pretend to be, you know, pregnant himself or talk about the baby he was going to have. And so it makes perfect sense that the same way when there's this new, this new virus or this, this new situation that you would hear some of that come out through their play. That's actually really, it's really great. It's a good way for them to make sense of the world. The other piece of that, that I think you did a really good job with, not surprisingly, I know what a great mom you are, is to, is that, you know, you can support them in using actual terms like, um, like like germs or talking about the virus and you can pick up on that and say oh I heard you talking about that so when I hear them talking about the virus or should I then how much of should I be responding to that like should we talk about this more specifically like in terms of the virus and like that's why we're at home or do we want to focus more on like a long spring break which is kind of how we had started this process like their school closed and it was like, oh, extra spring break. But now as time goes on, they're clearly picking up on more of what's going on. It's a, it's a really great question. And I think in my experience, a totally normal and a totally good parent response of wanting to protect your kid from upsetting or scary news. And it's a totally sort of natural gut reaction the issue is that when we don't talk about things with kids, the message isn't that, oh, this is okay. You don't have to worry about it. The message is, this is something that's too scary to talk about. And so, oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. You know, and it, cause they're obviously they're picking up on it, right. They're hearing things from the, from uh, around, you know, around the house. <laughs> it's, they hear things that are going on. They hear things on TV. And if you, aren't providing an explanation for what's going on, kids are going to come up with their own explanation for what's going on. Maybe assuming that school is canceled because they're in trouble or they did something wrong because kids tend to think of the world as really revolving around them in good ways and in, in ways that can, you know, make them think that things are their fault that really don't have anything to do with them. And the benefit of being proactive and talking about something like something that could be scary, like germs or the coronavirus with your kid is that you get to set the tone of the conversation. You get to define the terms. You get to tell them, you know, that there are germs um, in the environment. They're very tiny. We can't see them. And they can sometimes make us sick, but these are all the things we can do to stay safe. And these are all the things that we can do to stay healthy as opposed to, you know, whatever sort of magical idea they come up with in their head about something like that. The other reason it's important to be honest um, with your kids about what's going on in an age appropriate way, of course, is you want to be the trusted source of information for your kids. They are sponges, as you know, as we all know, as we all have funny stories um, about, and they will overhear you. They will see a video. They'll see something from a friend, hear something from a friend or family member. Again, obviously the sources are a little more limited these days. And if what they are seeing or hearing doesn't match up with what they're telling with with what they're hearing from you, then it can be confusing and they may not come to you with questions. But if they know that you're going to let them know what they need to know and, and give them explanations about what's going on, then if there's a mismatch, they're more likely to be coming to you and saying, wait, you know, you said this, and then I heard this, you know, what, what's that about? Yeah, that's a really good point because clearly there aren't, 
that many other sources, but they have their Zoom circle time with their yeah. parent, with oh, their yeah, teachers, yeah. I was mentioning. And like, they certainly are talking about the reasons for being home. So I do want to be like part of that conversation, not, not like have that just happening without like being a contributor to that or a trusted source for that. Exactly. I had, um, I had a mentor in during my training, a Bartel, who used to, used to frame it as don't for having difficult conversations with kids as don't force it, don't forbid it and follow their lead. And so I think that's a really nice way of sort of summarizing the way you want to have any sort of difficult conversation about any sort of difficult topic with your kids. So don't force it means not coming up to them every every day and saying, are you feeling, are you feeling sad now? Are you feeling worried now? Are you feeling, how about now? How about now? Are you feeling sad now? You know, or I think we should talk about some serious, <laughs> some serious topics that, you know, that kind of thing. But also don't forbid it. So if you hear them talking about the virus when they're playing, I know you wouldn't do this, but just as an example, not to come out and say, we don't, we don't talk about that. You know, that's not something to play about. That's not funny. You know, understanding that even if they're making jokes about it or playing around about it, it's because they're processing it you can use it as a jumping off point of a conversation, but letting them know that no topic is off limits and following their lead. So that's exactly sort of what I was saying before. If you if you hear them playing and talking about the virus, you know, walking out back and saying, well, you know, what's the virus? Something like that. Let them yeah. hear what they have to say about it first. So you can have an idea where they're coming from, what information they may have and hear whether how you want to want to address that. That is really, that's super helpful to start with a question so you can figure out where they are. Awesome. Okay. That is really helpful as like a general framework. I love that. And now let's turn to some specific things that work and don't as we're trying to help our kids feel safe. So starting with the positives with what works. First thing here we wanted to talk about was using the actual words to talk about. And we touched on this a little bit, but it would be great to hear more about why that's important. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Now this is another place where considering the developmental stage of the kid is obviously important. It's going to be different with, you know, with my two and a half year old versus your four year old twins versus anyone who, you know, if anyone's listening with school age kids, you don't have to give all of the information. You just have to give enough information so that they're under, they can understand, they have an understanding of what's going on around them. So for example, um, families that I work with, parents will want to say something like, oh, I'm just going to tell her she has a boo-boo in her tummy versus um, saying the word tumor or other words that can be, you know, very scary to use. But it's really important to use the right language because if you say someone has a boo-boo in their tummy and they're getting all of this intensive treatment for it, then what does it mean when they're they fall down in the street and get a boo-boo. Like what, what is, what does it mean when they're brother or sister? Do they have to go to the hospital? Is it very serious? So using, using correct language is important so that kids have an idea of what's going on. And that's the same, same idea as a word that a kid might be using that might sound scary to us. They likely don't have all of the same emotions connected to it or the same experience with it because this is new to them. So Again, when you're in the place of defining what that word means, you can keep it from being a huge deal and being very scary and just defining it on on your terms. It's really good to differentiate, I think, germ because I've been using germs, mm -hmm. but then, you know, Lark, my daughter, has strep got strep mm -hmm. throat like during this quarantine time. And when she when she heard that she had to take medicine, when she heard that she was sick, she was like how did I get sick? I washed my yeah. hands. Like yeah. she had never, like she thought it was her fault in this mm -hmm. way that before when mm -hmm. she got sick, she never had made that connection. Yeah. And so clearly she had gotten the fact that we're all washing our hands more because we're trying to keep germs away. But then, you know, if I maybe had separated that like germs versus this one specific mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. germ coronavirus, she might not have felt that same like guilt in that moment, you know, like it would have yeah. helped her to better understand what was happening. None of these things are a one-time conversation either. Right. You know, you can right. start off with germs and then because that's about as much as I think, for example, 
my son could understand right now. And then if something comes up and she seems worried about it, that's an opportunity to give her a little bit more information. She's, you know, again, not following her lead and, and realizing that that's a time that it would be good to, to fill in a little bit more. And I think we're all going to have to fill in a little bit more information in however long it is when we start going back out into the world and transitioning back to school and activities. We're going to have to help kids understand why it's safe now and to, to differentiate mm-hmm. between the regular things we do to stay healthy, like not licking your newborn brother's face <laughs> um, <laughs> from, the more, from the more extreme precautions that we're taking now, right? It's yeah. all germ busters, but it's different levels. And, you know, I've noticed that that my son now will talk about, get very nervous if he has sticky hands, which was never true before. He was fine with sticky hands all over the place and wanting to wash his hands a lot more. And so we talk about the difference between, you know, sticky hands after eating a popsicle and, you know, worrying about germs and that kind of thing. So I think it doesn't mean that you, it sounds like you did the exact right thing. You gave some information to start off with, let her know that she could, that this was a topic that you could talk about. And when she started having more questions, then you answered them as they came. Yeah. Well, thank you. But, and that also comes into our second kind of thing that works, which is taking cues from your kids. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, I struggle with some of the things that I feel like break my heart right now, like the fact that they can't go to school, they can't see their grandparents, you know, they are adapting very well to like Zoom circle time. They love FaceTiming with grandparents. They, they're actually seeing their grandparents more often, like almost daily in a way that they hadn't before, you know? So like, there's some positives that come out of it. They just sometimes will talk about like when they're out and about again is the phrase Mm -hmm. they've picked up on. It's like, they want to go to the ice cream store. We canceled a trip to Disney, but they don't feel, they don't seem that concerned about it. They're just like, oh, when we can go out and about again, we'll go to Disney Mm -hmm. World. So I think maybe not like projecting your sadness onto your kids (laughs) no no that's exactly that's exactly right and I think I think that's where we can get stuck in all the worries that we have about everything that's going on because we have all of this information and understanding that kids can that we can protect them from some of those those bigger emotions and those worries and we can protect them by giving them just the information that they need and not having to give them the bigger worries so when they talk about going out and about again, you're having this, or, you know, we were talking about, you know, with the schools closing, I'm feeling sad. Oh, is Ben going to get to see his teachers again? Is he going to be sad about this? But I don't want to assume that that's how he's feeling. So when they talk about going out and about again, or Ben, ben talks about going clothes shopping, <laughs> um, you can talk about how exciting that will be, you know, maybe adding things that you're looking forward to too. But you can also model talking about feeling sad sometimes about things that you're missing out on so that they know it's okay to talk about those things too. So not making a huge deal of it, but saying, oh yeah, I really miss, you know, going on walks or I really miss having play dates and don't have to say it in a dramatic way, just very matter of factly. And it leaves it open for them to say, oh yeah, I'm feeling sad about this too, or I miss this too. I think we all as adults are (laughs) wishing there was not to speak for everyone, but wishing there was an end date for this. But if that's not something that they're asking for, then you don't have to worry about answering that question. If they're starting to ask that, then, you know, you can think about ways to answer it. You don't want to promise something that's not, that's not possible. Right. So, right. Since we don't know, since we really don't know right now, you know, making sure that you're not saying something like, oh, well, don't worry. Next year, you'll be able to start school on time. We all hope for that, but we don't know that yet. So, Instead, focusing on, well, you know, all of there's lots of scientists working really hard to figure out ways to keep everybody healthy. And once we know the best ways to do that, and you know, or you know, that that's when we'll be able to go back and that sort of you know, fudging it a little bit that way. And the third tip we have here is to think about what information they have access to. So this really sparked for me, as I mentioned, I guess it really stuck with me when I saw Lark's teacher showing a face mask on her Zoom circle time, which I just would not have expected. Mm -hmm. Um, And if I hadn't happened to be watching that day, you know, often I'm trying to get work done during that Mm -hmm, time. I just, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. she wanted me to snuggle that day and I saw it. So I think, you know, it's just 
as you said, you think your kids have fewer sources of information now, but you still need to like think about it maybe, or just try to be present, I guess, if you can. Yeah, I, this is this is always true that it's a good idea to try to be present with little kids if possible when they're watching something on on a tablet or computer or TV. Although any of us trying to get anything done at home know that yeah. <laughs> the value of, of using a couple episodes of Daniel Tiger. So having a sense of what could, you know, obviously you're not going to sit them down in front of the news, but being <laughs> being mindful of that, that an episode of Daniel Tiger that you kind of know by heart is different than maybe something at school where some of these questions could come up and maybe keeping an ear out. And then even if you're not sitting right there, you know, following up with them about what they talked about at school, because they're, they're getting to the age when they can probably tell you a little bit more accurately about that. Yeah. Okay. And we have a bonus fourth thing that works is to remember that kids are resilient. So I know that we, you and I have chatted about this and it helped me to feel better. So just about this time and kind of how the kids will be on the other side of it. Yeah, yeah, I would say that's absolutely true. There's, I would say two pieces. One is that kids are very resilient. They are very adaptable. And so they'll adapt to this and they'll adapt to the new, whatever new normal that we go back to after this. The other piece that I would say is that while there's no manual for parenting during during a quarantine or during coronavirus that that you that we as parents are the experts in our kids we know them best and just as we've been able to help them through more typical difficult situations like a first day of school or difficulties with friends as different as this feels a lot of the same principles apply and that we have the the skills to parent during this as well Thank you. That's great. Okay. So turning to some things that don't work or that you would, you know, recommend avoiding. I think one of them that we both maybe fell into was, and you had a better excuse than I did, but (laughs) number one here was not having a routine when all of this started, you know, none of this was expected. And we, we had a routine, we all had our routines planned, right. You know, to continue going to school and the things that we're doing. And so this is getting thrown for, for a big loop. And so nothing bad is going to happen with a couple weeks of, of things being a little bit up in the air, but it, we definitely know that kids thrive with routine and with things being expected and with regular limits. Um, you know, every, I would say that Ben is definitely uh, my son. My older son is testing some of these where he came down for breakfast this morning and wanted a popsicle for breakfast. And, you know, <laughs> you know yeah, than that. But it's really reassuring for kids when the same rules are kept in place. And as much as he initially was frustrated that I said no to the popsicle, it actually, you know, is reassuring to him to know that it's still the same rules. Like everything hasn't gone out the window. You still can't have a popsicle for breakfast. So when you feel tempted to sort of give in, because there was a moment that I was like, okay, you know what? This is, everything's crazy. Why shouldn't you have a popsicle for breakfast? But actually start to feel like they can't, they don't know what to expect from anything and that they don't know, they don't know all the rules are out the window. And so that can actually lead just to more testing limits and more feeling of insecurity. So routine, regular rules, regular limits. And of course, with some, you know, some alteration thrown in and some special treats thrown in and you can explain to them, this is the special treat, but you know, this is, this is not what we're, you know, doing every day. So we have implemented, there's a restaurant by us that does contactless, you know, pizza takeout. And we've said, that was asking for pizza like every night, because in the beginning, we were (laughs) a little more flexible with, with what he was eating. And now we've sort of said, you know, pizza is for Saturdays, right? And that's, and he knows that and we can say that and he'll push back a little bit, but not as much as he was before. Uh, Number two here is uh, talking around the kids when I don't think they're listening. Uh, This was definitely a fail for me at first. It's just amazing. You can think they're like, completely in a different world, like in front of a, you know, TV show or something, or on a different floor, but they're just hearing everything. Yeah. Yeah. Even when they're even when they're totally zoned out in front of a television show, I mean, Ben was watching something during his screen time and Duncan and I were 
talking about something, you know, state of the world related. And he, he said, I said, Oh, maybe we shouldn't talk about this in front of Ben. And he's like, Oh, he's not listening. And I really thought he wasn't. And one of us was like, Ben, are you listening? He was like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah totally okay okay good to know good to know um well, so of course I have you because this is something like I think I even discussed this on last week's episode that I had done this so if you do this right and you've had some conversation mm-hmm. around your kids and you should you then like bring it up should you say like what did you just hear or should you wait for them to ask questions or like what is the next step after I inevitably fail at this again (laughs) you know I think you said fail and we all have this idea of parenting fails but I appreciate you framing it that way because I think it's important to keep in mind one of my favorite developmental ideas which is the idea of the the good enough parent or the good enough mother the good enough parent uh which is the uh, developmental theorist Winnicott used that term and it, it there's a lot behind it. But basically what it means is that we're not supposed to be perfect as parents and that the times that we slip up or we don't do things exactly the way we wanted to or meet our children's needs exactly the way we might in an ideal world gives them a chance to learn and grow and and adapt. So I just want to say that when you when you say fail, it's actually oh, okay. It's, okay. It's, a, it's a good it's a good thing. And especially that you're thinking you're thinking about what the best way is to address it. So I, I think the answer is it depends. Yeah. If you if it's pretty clear that they heard and they're asking a question, I would just jump off right there and and give a little explanation of, at an age appropriate level of the thing that that you were talking about. If they seem worried about it or if you hear it come out later on I think it's fine to address it then as well I don't think you need to make a big deal out of it and number three things that don't work this will be shocking to everyone but yelling at your kids when they fail to social distance so this was another one for me so when we were doing we used to do like socially distanced scoots around the neighborhood Mm -hmm. we stopped doing that just Mm because it feels a little fraught and a little too crowded in our neighborhood and our kids would always you know they scoot up ahead of me and they would stop at a stoplight and then somebody would walk too close to them and I would be like come back get over here like you know and they would turn around and be like who is that crazy lady you know not a way to make them feel safe probably to yell at them to get away from (laughs) yeah yeah. and when but again this is this is happens to all of us this is another example of like not needing to be perfect all the time. So totally fair. Ben was being loud the other day when the baby was having, this is not quarantine related. This is just, you know, he was being loud and I started um, yelling at him (laughs) to be quiet, which doesn't make a lot of sense. But I think anytime we have a reaction as parents that we wish we hadn't, it can be an opportunity to model apologizing to your kids and explaining how you're, you were feeling. And I was feeling, I yelled because I was feeling worried you know, let's make a plan for next time we go outside so that you know the rules and you know when to stop. And I mean, again, to reiterate, you know, not being too hard on yourself, in addition to making them feel safe emotionally, you, your job is to keep them safe physically. And I think that's what you were, you know, that's what the motivation was. That's what you were trying to do. And you can explain that to them and they'll understand. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Molly. This is super helpful advice and we will be right back to answer a community question after a short break. Hi, Christy here. I wanted to take a minute to talk to you about Kalugo. I'm excited to share that our best-selling award-winning compact stroller just got an upgrade. We incorporated your feedback and we've come out with new improved features that are sure to be your new favorites. First, a new super secure, super easy magnetic buckle. Second, wider wheels. Third, an updated harness. To see all of these new features in action, head over to our website, www.highcalugo.com. Now back to the show. Hi, we are back now to answer a community question in our Have You Tried segment. And today our question is about how we as parents can help ourselves feel safe too during this crazy time. Molly, as we talked about, works with both kids and adults. So Molly, I would love to hear your thoughts on how we can, because I'm sure also if parents are feeling Mm -hmm. more confident, more secure, that'll Mm -hmm. help us parent too. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And first of all, the same way that it's totally normal and expected that our kids are going to be testing limits a little bit these days and, um, and having some, some new worries and having some questions. It's of course, totally normal and expected that, um, that us adults are feeling some anxiety right now. It's, I think I told you it's it's an interesting time to to have just had a baby when it's not unusual to to feel a little anxious. I definitely felt that the first time around with my with my older son, but this time I'm feeling anxious and so is everybody else around me. Um, yeah, it's hard to calibrate. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's been an interesting comparison, I would say. Um, and I'm fortunate to have a really supportive partner, my husband, Duncan, but he's feeling anxious too. And it's been, we've had to navigate how each of us process and how we each feel anxious differently, which we, you know, which we knew already, but it's just become a lot more clear. So Duncan really tends to, tends to like to look on the bright side and say, oh, well, this, you know, this is hard now, but these good things can come out of it. And for me, I, I, that feels, that can sometimes feel a little bit invalidating if I'm, if I'm feeling anxious, but we've, we've had really good conversations about that and been able to better understand ourselves and each other, which has been helpful. So I think if you have a partner that you're co-parenting with and, um, or another loved one, um, it's good to, to talk about the ways that you're feeling anxious and to have a good understanding about how each of you are being affected by this in the same way that you're thinking about how your kids are, are being affected so that you can support each other during this time. I think it's really, and now I'm going to be talking about a, a positive that's coming out of this, but I actually think it's really helped us improve our communication, which has been nice. Many people are talking about taking some time and some space for yourself, which is easier said than done when you're working from home and taking care of kids at home. But even some of the normal times that we would have to decompress, like a commute home from work or time at the office, everything's been sort of condensed into a very small bubble. And so acknowledging where you've lost some of those transition periods or spaces for yourself and trying to find ways to implement them again, I think can be, can be helpful as well. And, you know, it's maybe a little obvious as a psychiatrist here, but, you know, keeping in mind that the therapy can also be helpful. And a lot of providers are, um, most all providers now have moved on to, you know, online telehealth or telepsychiatry formats and as much as another zoom meeting might not be the thing that you're craving right now if you're really finding it overwhelming it's it's not a bad idea yeah I mean in some ways I'm sure it's almost maybe I don't know if this is true I felt this way with like telemedicine for the kids when I needed when Lark needed an appointment when she had strep like it almost felt more accessible yeah. in a way because we didn't have to <laughs> like leave yep. the house and I don't know if you know, therapists have more appointments or if they're able to kind of stack patients in a different way, but it could be you'll able to access it in a way that you couldn't before. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. I, I, I've done some telehealth appointments before and one of my colleagues was joking, oh, I don't have any cancellations anymore, <laughs> because, <laughs> um, <laughs> which all of us use to sort of get extra work done because, you know, you're right there, you're on your computer. So I think, I think it can make it a little bit more accessible and I, I wouldn't be surprised if some people continue with, with that, even, even when some of this starts to transition back to, to normal again. All right. Well, thank you so much for being here, Molly. It was great to chat with you. Yeah. Great um, to chat with you. I'm, I know. Can't wait till it's in person again. I know we'll do it. We'll do a follow-up episode and we can be sitting next to each other, a glass of wine. So yes. thank you. That is what we have for today. If you have questions for Molly or comments on today's episode, you can head to Kalugo's Instagram, which is at hi Kalugo. Our music was provided by Sound Planet. Our awesome producer is Aaron McGregor. I'm Christy from Kalugo. We'll be back soon to share more about our adventures in parenting. Until then, remember... You got this.